Stuart Little, Chapter 12, The Schoolroom. While Dr. Carey was making repairs on the car, Stuart went shopping. He decided since he was about to take a long motor trip, he should have the proper clothes. He went to a doll shop and they had things which were the right size for him and outfitted himself completely with new luggage, suits, shirts, and accessories. He charged everything and was well pleased with his purchases. That night, he slept at the doctor's apartment. The next morning, Stuart started early to avoid traffic. He thought it would be a good idea to get out on the road before there were too many cars and trucks. He drove through Central Park to 110th Street, then over to the West Side Highway, and then north to the Saw Mill River Parkway. The car ran beautifully, and although people were inclined to stare at him, Stuart didn't mind. He was very careful not to press the button, which had caused so much trouble the day before. He made up his mind that he would never use that button again. Just as the sun was coming up, Stuart saw a man seated in thought by the side of the road. Stuart steered his car alongside, stopped, and put his head out. You're worried about something, aren't you? asked Stuart. Yes, I am, said the man, who was tall and mild. Can I help you in any way? asked Stuart in a friendly voice. The man shook his head. It's an impossible situation, I guess, he replied. You see, I'm the superintendent of schools in this town. That's not an impossible situation, said Stuart. It's bad but not impossible. Well, continued the man, I've always got problems that I can't solve. Today, for instance, one of my teachers is sick, Miss Gunderson, her name is. She teaches number seven school. I've got to find a substitute for her, a teacher who will take her place. What's the matter with her? asked Stuart. I don't know exactly. The doctor says she may have rhinestones, said the superintendent. Can't you find another teacher, asked Stuart. No, that's the trouble. There's nobody in this town who knows anything. No spare teachers, no anything. School is supposed to begin in an hour. I'll be glad to take Mrs. Gunderson's place for a day, if you would like, suggested Stuart agreeably. The superintendent of schools looked up. Really? Certainly, said Stuart, glad to. He opened the door of the little car and stepped out. Walking around to the rear, he opened the baggage compartment and took out his suitcase. If I'm to conduct my class in a schoolroom, I'd better take off these motoring togs and get into something more suitable, he said. Stuart climbed the bank, went into the bushes, and was back in a few minutes wearing a pepper and salt jacket, old striped trousers, and a Windsor tie, and spectacles. He folded his older clothes and packed them away in the suitcase. Do you think you can maintain discipline, asked the superintendent. Of course I can, replied Stuart. I'll make work interesting and the discipline will take care of itself. Don't worry about me. The man thanked him and they shook hands. At quarter before nine, the scholars had gathered in school number seven. When they missed Mrs. Gunderson, the word got around that there would be a substitute. They were delighted. A substitute, somebody whispered to somebody else. A substitute, a substitute. The news traveled fast and soon everyone in the schoolroom knew that they were all to have a rest from Mrs. Gunderson for at least a day and were going to have a wonderful experience of being taught by a strange teacher whom nobody had ever seen before. Stuart arrived at nine. He parked his car briskly at the door of the school, stalked boldly into the room found a yardstick leaning against Mrs. Gunderson's desk and climbed head over hand to the top. There he found an inkwell, a pointer, some pens and some pencils, a bottle of ink, some chalk, a bell, two hairpins, and three or four books in a pile. Stuart scrambled nimbly up to the top of the stack of the books and jumped for the bottom of the bell, up the bottom on the bell. 
His weight was enough to make it ring, and Stuart promptly slid down, walked to the front of the desk, and said, Let me have your attention, please. The boys and girls crowded around the desk to look at the substitute. Everyone talked at once, and they seemed to be, be very much pleased. The girls giggled, <laughs> and the boys laughed. <laughs> and everyone's eyes lit up with excitement to see such a small and good-looking teacher so appropriately dressed. Let me have your attention, please, repeated Stuart. As you know, Mrs. Gunderson is sick, and I am taking her place. What's the matter with her? asked Roy Hart eagerly. Vitamin trouble, replied Stuart. She took vitamin D when she needed A. She took vitamin B when she was short of vitamin C, and her system became overloaded with rabofablin. Vitamin trouble, replied Stuart. She took vitamin D when she needed A. She took B when she, need, when she was short of C, and her system became overloaded with riboflavian, thiamine, hydrochloride, and even with paradoxine, the need for which in human nutrition has not been established. Let it be a lesson for us all. He glared fiercely at the children, and they made no more inquiries about Mrs. Gunderson. Everyone will now take his or her seat, commanded Stuart. The pupils filed obediently down the aisles and dropped to their seats, and in a moment there was a silence in the classroom. Stuart cleared his throat, <clears throat> seizing a coat lapel in either hand to make himself look more like a professor. Stuart began, Anyone absent? The scholars shook their heads. Anybody late? They shook their heads. Very well, said Stuart. What's the first subject you all usually take in the morning? Arithmetic, shouted the children. Bother arithmetic, snapped Stuart. Let's skip it. There were wild shouts of enthusiasm at the suggestion. Everyone in the class seemed perfectly willing to skip arithmetic for one morning. What next do you study, asked Stuart. Spelling, cried the children. Well, said Stuart, a misspelled word is an abomination in the sight of everyone. I consider it a very fine thing to spell words correctly, and I strongly urge every one of you to buy a Webster's Collegiate Dictionary and consult it whenever you are in the slightest doubt. So much for spelling. What's next? The scholars were just as pleased to be let out of spelling as they were about arithmetic. And they shouted for joy. Yippee! And everyone looked at everybody else and laughed <laughs> and waved handkerchiefs and rulers. And some of the boys threw spitballs at some of the girls. Stuart had to climb onto the pile of books again to dive for the bell to restore order. What's next? He repeated. Writing, cried the scholars. Goodness, said Stuart in disgust. Don't you children know how to write? Certainly we do, yelled one and all. So much for that, then said Stuart. Social studies comes next, cried Elizabeth Gardner eagerly. Social studies? Never heard of them, said Stuart. Instead of taking up any so special subject this morning, why, don't, why wouldn't it be a good idea if we just talked about something? The scholars glared at each other in expectancy. Could we talk about the way it feels to hold a snake in your hand and and then it winds itself around your wrist, said Arthur Greenlaw. We could, but I'd rather not, replied Stuart. Could we talk about sin and vice, cried Lydia Lacey. Nope, said Stuart. Try again. Could we talk about the fat woman at the circus and she had hair all over her chin, begged Isidore Finberg. Reminiscently, no, said Stuart. I'll tell you. Let's talk about the king of the world. He looked all around the room, hoping to see cho how the children liked the idea. There isn't any king of the world, said Harry. Jameson, in disgust. What's the diff? said Stuart. There ought to be one. Kings are old fashioned, said Hen Harry. Well, all right, then, let's talk about the chairman of the world. The world gets into a lot of trouble because it has no chairman. I would like to be the chairman of the world myself. 
You're too small, said Mary Binnix. Oh, fish feathers, said Stuart. Size has nothing to do with it. It's temperament and the ability that counts. The chairman has to have ability and he must know what's important. How many of you know what's important? Up went up all the hands. Very good, said Stuart, cocking one leg across the other and shoving his hands in his pockets of his jacket. Henry Rackmeyer, you tell us what is important. A shaft of sunlight at the end of a dark af afternoon, a note of music in the way the back of a baby's neck smells if its mother keeps it tidy, answered Harry. Correct, said Stuart. Those are the important things. You forgot one, though. Mary Binnix, what did Harry Rackmeyer forget? He forgot ice cream with chocolate sauce on it, said Mary quickly. Exactly, said Stuart. Ice cream is important. Well, now, if I'm going to be chairman of the world this morning, we've got to have some rules. Otherwise, it will be too confusing with everyone running every which way and helping himself to things and nobody behaving. We've got to have some laws if we're going to play at this game. Can anyone suggest any good laws for the world? Albert Fernstern raised his hand. Don't eat mushrooms. They might be toad stools, suggested Albert. That's not a law, said Stuart. That's merely a bit of friendly advice. Very good advice, Albert, but advice and law are not the same. Law is much more solemn than advice. Law is extremely solemn. Anybody else think of a law for the world? Nix on swiping anything, suggested John Polodowski solemnly. Very good, said Stuart. Good law. Never poison anything but rats, said Anthony Berniski. That's no good, said Stuart. It's unfair to rats. A law has to be fair to everyone. Anthony looked sulkily. But rats are unfair to us, he said. Rats are objectionable. I know they are, said Stuart. But from a rat's point of view, poison is objectionable. A chairman has to see all sides of a problem. Have you got a rat's point of view? asked Anthony. You look like a little rat. No, replied Stuart. I have more the point of a view of a mouse, which is very different. I see things whole. It's obvious to me that rats are underprivileged. They've never been able to get out in the open. Rats don't like the open, said Agnes. That's because whenever they come out, somebody socks them. Rats might like the open if they were allowed to use it. Any other ideas for laws, Agnes? Agnes raised her hand. There ought to be a law against fighting. Impractical, said Stuart. Men like to fight. But you're getting warm, Agnes. No scrapping, asked Agnes timidly. Stuart shook his head. Absolutely, no being mean, suggested Mildred Hoff Hoffenstein. Very fine law, said Stuart. When I am a chairman, when I am chairman, anybody who is mean to anybody else is going to catch it. That won't work, replied Herbert Pendergast. Some people are just naturally mean. Albert Fernstern is always being mean to me. I'm not saying it'll work, said Stuart. It's a good law, and we'll give it a try. We'll give it a, a try right here and now. Someone do something mean to somebody else. Harry Jamerson, you be mean to Catherine Stableford. Wait a minute now. What's that you've got in your hand, Catherine? It's a little tiny pillow stuffed with sweet balsam. Does it say for you I pine, for you I balsam, balsam on it? Yes, said Catherine. Do you love it very much, asked Stuart. Yes, I do, said Catherine. Okay, Harry, grab it. Take it away. Harry ran over to where Catherine sat, grabbed the little pillow from her hand, and ran back to his seat while Catherine screamed. Now then, said Stuart in a 
fierce voice. Hold on. My good people, while your chairman consults the book of rules, he pretended to thumb through a book. Here we are. Page 492. Absolutely no being mean. Page 560. Nick's on swiping anything. Harry Jameson has broken two laws. The laws against being mean and the law against swiping. So, uh, let's get Harry and set him straight back before he becomes so mean people will hardly recognize him any anymore. Come on. Stuart ran for the yardstick and slid down like a fireman coming down a pole in a firehouse. He ran towards Harry and the other children, jumped up from their seats and raced up and down the aisles and crowded around Harry while Stuart demanded that he give up the little pillow. Harry looked frightened. Although he knew it was just a test, he gave Catherine the pillow. There, it worked pretty well, said Stuart. No being mean is a perfectly good law. He wiped his face with his handkerchief, for he was quite warm for the exertion of just being chairman of the world. It had taken more running and leaping and sliding than he had imagined. Catherine was very much pleased to have her pillow back. Let's see the little pillow a minute, said Stuart, whose curiosity was beginning to get the better of him. Catherine showed it to him. It was about as long as Stuart was high, and Stuart suddenly thought, what a fine, sweet-smelling bed that would make for him. He began to want the pillow himself. That's a very pretty thing, said Stuart, trying to hide his eagerness. You don't want to sell it, do you? Oh, no, replied Catherine. It was a present to me. I suppose it was given to you by a boy you met at Lake Hoppenkong last summer. And it reminds you of him, muttered Stuart dreamily. Yes, it was, said Catherine, blushing. Ah, said Stuart, summers are wonderful, aren't they, Catherine? Yes, and last summer was the most wonderful summer I have ever had in all my life. I can imagine it, replied Stuart. You sure you wouldn't want to sell that little pillow? Catherine shook her head. Don't know, as I blame you replied Stuart quietly. Summertime is important. It's like a shaft of sunlight. Or a note of music, said Elizabeth Aikson. Or the way the back of a baby's neck smells if its mother keeps it tight, keep it tidy, said Marilyn Roberts. Stuart sighed. Ah, never forget your summer times, my dears, he said. Well, I've got to be going along. It's been a pleasure to know you all. Class is dismissed. Stuart strode rapidly to the door and climbed into the car and with a final wave of his hand drove off in the northerly direction while the children raced alongside and screamed, Goodbye! 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 They all wished they could have a substitute every day instead of Mrs. Gunderson.